Who are you talking about? The school or the so public health? He uh, he gave the South Florida number, and in his critique of theirs, he said, you know, and they're going to work on problems that are really important to the citizens of Florida, like schistosomiasis. Well, I almost fell off the stool. <laughs> there hasn't been a case of schistosomiasis in this state. Yeah, <laughs> I just, so, but it was all politics, and that, you know, that ended it. Our proposal was for $750,000. They got the program for four and a half million. So, but Bob was very successful and he should have been. But it was, now, you know, what did we, uh, I think our, uh, the, certainly the program in uh, hospital administration, Barry Green had a, had a fabulous, developed a fabulous program in hospital administration. He is a tremendous program, our department chairman. Uh, Nate Perry, Nate was, uh, Nate was an interesting department chairman. And he was chair of? Clinical and Health Psychology. Nate died last year. Tremendous loss. Uh, his wife was a graduate student in that department years ago. Graduate. She's now at uh, Florida State uh, on the faculty. Um, he's a great guy. Um, real interesting individual. Um, interesting man to deal with. In what way? Well, uh, you always knew where you stood with Nate. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes he would agree with you. Many times he disagreed with you, but when he disagreed with you, you always knew when, where he stood. But that's what I liked about him. He, he was never one to, uh, uh, to uh, not let you know where he stood. Uh, uh, so we had... Uh, I thought we had a chairman who uh, always spoke their peace. I think one of the things we did, and I don't know that they've ever done it since, we went through a very, very good strategic planning uh, time where we had an outside person come in and conduct it. Uh, we did it at the same time that, uh, in fact, we used the strategic plan to, uh, as a basis to get rid of the two programs we got rid of. Uh, and uh, it, uh, um, it just, uh, I, I thought it, it, it just helped me. I knew I had to do it, but it just gave me more evidence that what I was doing was the right thing to do. But it, it also bolstered, bolstered uh, the, uh, the programs and the departments that I wanted to support. So, uh, but... Uh, you know, when you go two years without faculty increases, that's tough. That's tough. It's not only tough 
for the two years they don't get increases. What people don't realize on the outside is that it's two years that the faculty miss out on retirement income. And as good as my boss was, I couldn't get him to understand that either. Because that's, that's the thing that hurts is that they go two years without retirement. Did you lose a lot of faculty at that point then? We lost some, particularly in, in the departments where you, the competitive departments, like psychology. See, that's where you, you hate to lose them because the research departments are where you lose them. See, you, the academic departments are the, the research departments are where you lose them. Because they can go anywhere. They can go anywhere. And they may, be ha they may have grants that they can take. That's it. Them. See, that's it. See, that's, uh, that's the, that's the, and that's, you know, that was the other thing when I came here. Uh, there wasn't, there wasn't the emphasis on research that there should have been in this college. And it the faculty didn't like to hear that. You know, um, this is a good college. But, you know, there are a lot of good colleges. In the final analysis, this college is going to be judged how good it is by the research that the faculty that's the yardstick that they're going to be judged against, particularly in an academic health center. And, and those dollars are getting harder to get every single year. And that's why when you look at departments like medical technology, clinical and community dietetics, there's no money for them to do research. There is money in clinical and health psychology, in PT and OT. And you, yes, you got to go after it. You got to really scrape to get it, but that's all right. That's what makes you competitive. But that's where the strong departments are. They're after those dollars. And that's you know, the stronger departments. I used to go on accreditation site visits for American Physical Therapy Association. And I can tell you, the stronger departments and the stronger programs in this country are the programs that are doing research. Were you able to boost the faculty participation in research? Yes, yeah, uh, they did. Uh, PTs were able to get more clinical and health psychology, OTs, were able to, to get them. Uh, Health Services Administration increased their, their, uh, their research dollars. We were very successful every year in, in, in gradually increasing the research dollars. Now, yeah, faculty didn't like to hear that, but I mean, that's, that's really where, and you know, 
And what rewards were there? The rewards are those that get research dollars get rewarded at the end of the year by a little extra on salaries. That's, that's in the name of the game. Were you able to continue research as dean? No. No. Uh, and particularly in microbiology. Now, there's... No, there, uh, there would be no opportunity for, mm -hmm. for me to do that. Uh, it was, you know, uh, I didn't even, I, other than being chairman of the infection control committee, there were, there were no, no opportunities for me to even think as a microbiologist. That was the nice thing about being chairman of the infection control committee. At least I could think as a microbiologist. Well, as um, as a dean in the health science center, you were interacting to a greater or lesser extent with other colleges. What was that experience like? Did you have a great deal of interaction? Was it collegial or? My interaction with the other deans was mainly through uh, serving as chairman of the selection of the dean's committee, search committee for the dean of the College of Medicine and dean for the College of uh, Dentistry, dean for the College of Dentistry. And when was that? Uh, I, I was chairman twice for the Dean of the College of Medicine and once for the College of Dentistry. And did you, were you able to continue doing any teaching? Uh, I have to think, uh, the last time I, gosh, Don't think I. Well, I know I didn't. I once. Yeah, I haven't taught in the College of Medicine since. Uh, hmm. Oh, it's at least five, six years. But you longer was that after retirement? Then you you did teaching, or did you teach as dean as well? Oh yes. Okay. When I was dean, I was doing some teaching. Okay. Mm -hmm. What kind? Of, what were you teaching? In uh, College of Medicine, okay. and in I was giving a few micro. Yes, courses okay. in micro. Yeah. For t uh, at one time, when I first came here, uh, when I first came here, I was the only. <laughs> I was the only one in the microbiology department in College of Medicine who had any bacteriology training. <laughs> <laughs> was was everyone else in uh, virology? All virology. <laughs> How many lectures in the microbiology courses would that end up being for you then? Oh, golly. I had given some in Strep in Nyseria. I gave a few, I think, one year also in, uh, they always like to hear them in bioterrorism. But that reminds me, you said that um, when you were working with the Navy, that you were involved in, um, I guess, just biological warfare mm -hmm. research, what, what did that involve? I was working uh, with uh, Pasteurella pestis, the plague bacillus. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with uh, uh, the organism that causes shigellosis, which is not a very good uh, 
biological warfare. It doesn't seem to be terribly debilitating. I mean, I guess it would be over the long term, but not in the immediate. It's not a good one. Plague would be a good one. Mm -hmm. Um, Was this in terms of figuring out how to spread it or how to protect? No, we were doing animal uh, exposure studies through aerosols. Mm -hmm. And de- uh, doing aerosol studies, uh, determining uh, the minimal number of organisms that would infect mm-hmm. guinea pigs and monkeys, using uh, isolates from animals that they got f- from the wild, mm-hmm. recent isolates. Maybe you can answer a question that I have just in looking at the history of medicine, you have the bubonic plague and then the pneumonic plague. Is that a mm. different form or yes. is it just that? Pneumonic plague is, it causes pneumonia. Bubonic mm. plague causes a systemic infection. And how does that, because it sometimes seems that there were, it would start out as bubonic and then become more pneumonic. Does the, are there different bacteria involved or do they mutate? It's the same organism but it just causes a different type of infection. Okay, and is it just, does it happen because it enters the bloodstream or because it, it becomes aerosolized? Well, if, if it causes, it all depends how it enters the system. Oh, okay. If it enters the bloodstream, then it would cause a bubonic mm-hmm. infection, systemic infection. If it enters the respiratory tract, then it will cause a, a pneumonia. Mm-hmm. But if it enters the, the bloodstream, it could still cause a pneumonic infection if it gets into the bloodstream and then gets into the, uh, into, uh, carries through the blood into the, uh, lung, into the lungs, okay. or vice versa. Because okay. I know the pneumonic form is because in animals you can see you'll see both so in in terms of bioterrorism then I guess are you still active in, in no I used to serve on the bioterrorism task force in the health center uh, and uh, I still have a real interest in that uh, I uh, I think there are some interesting ways we could have bioterrorism attacks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you see as being the most um, likely or, or the most deadly? Mm-hmm. Or are they separate? I think plague is a likely bacterial mm-hmm. organism. Um, now that we've eradicated smallpox uh, and we no longer immunize against smallpox, I think smallpox has the potential uh, to uh, uh, if disseminated properly mm-hmm. to uh, be a likely character for a bioterrorism attack. Um, uh, I think there are some other viruses that uh, um, might be also, but see, there are other viruses that are non-human, particularly if we look at Florida. And if you look at the coasts of Florida and the way to gain access to Florida, I'm not so sure I would worry about the humans right now. And if I wanted to really do something to affect Florida, particularly now that we're worried about uh, the economy. And if we were to look at the citrus industry and the cattle industry, well, I would do something to affect uh, the cattle industry. So 
I might introduce the virus that causes foot and mouth disease. And then I might do something that affects the citrus industry. Now think of what would happen if I introduced the foot and mouth disease virus. And if I introduce something that affects the citrus industry, think what that would mean to the economics of this state. You know, I haven't touched you at all. That the state's in but chaos. Think of the morale problems mm -hmm. I've created for you. And the years now, problems I've created for you. Now you have to destroy all those citrus trees. It's going to take years for them to come back. And you know, I can come on to your shores and I can do that in one or two nights and you'll never know it. Uh, and well, with the cattle, I guess there's then the quarantine issues and a lot, just a lot of chaos that would be generated that goes in beyond the economic yeah. um, destruction. So see, I think we have a tendency to overlook that and only worry about the human aspects. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I think, you know, yeah, the first wave with the humans, but then we can immunize, see. And uh, yeah, we'll lose lives in the first wave, but if you destroy the economic basis, then it takes longer to recover. Absolutely. Well, let me go back to uh, just yeah. thinking about the, the college. Um, I, I, I'm in doing research and just learning about the history of the Health Science Center. I am impressed by May, Daryl Mays' vision. I, I think that the whole Health Center is really started by visionaries. J. Hillis Miller, Absolutely. George Harrell. Um, but it seems like uh, Dr. Mays, he had the Clinical Services Center on campus first. Right. And then he was brought in and participated in planning the health center. Um, so a lot of his ideas were incorporated right at the start. And just with your experience in colleges of health professions, how was he unique? You know, I guess you said he really created the term or the idea of the allied health professions, but what else was he doing that was so unusual? Well, see, I think, to me, Daryl was unique in that this idea of bringing the professions together in a college, mm -hmm. because that that was that was his his idea. Uh, so that started with him. Uh, the whole the the idea that we have a professional organization, the Association of Allied Health Professions, he and Dr. Joe Hamburg. Uh, Warren Perry, that, you know, that group helped start that organization. So, you know, nationally and internationally, he's involved with that. Um, this idea of the team approach to health care is, 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 of Daryl, collaboration, cooperation, that's, that's Daryl. Uh, it's, you 
is. There's just so much wrapped up in that, that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, uh, That encompasses so much, I think. Okay. Just that idea. That that with Daryl, that. Uh, How do you think he got the idea? Pardon? How do you think he got the idea to do that in the first place? Well, I think it. I think he saw it primarily. His main interest was rehab, and I think he saw it through rehab. I, you know, I never talked with Daryl about that specifically, but I think as he looked at a rehab patient, I think he saw that there was no one person in rehab who could really take care of the patient's needs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where he saw that it was a multiple multiplicity of tasks, that, including the social worker, mm -hmm. who was going to have to take care of the patient. Mm -hmm. And that's where he saw everyone involved with the patient. And uh, I think that's where he got just got the notion that... Uh, there was no one individual who could do this. And I guess from the perspective, psychologists also really... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, the psychology of, of the individual who is, who is truly traumatized, who is paralyzed and knows that he has to be that way for the rest of his life. You know, I don't know that we can appreciate what he goes through unless we were, quote, his shoes. Mm -hmm. Because that's a tremendous thing to face. Yeah, I, uh, no, that's a tremendous responsibility. Well, I guess we really should, we're about half an hour into the, we're now two and a half hours into it, so we, I should think about wrapping up. Um, you were dean of the College of public health and health professions from 1980 to 1995, and you retired in 1995. Right. Um, but um, your retirement hasn't been just sitting around. <laughs> I know that you've continued to be very active in the health science center. What sort of projects have you been working on since? Well, when I first retired, I was working with Pat Winning, who was the... Uh, Associate Vice President for Planning for the Health Science Center, and I was just working with her part-time, uh, doing some work with her on, on planning. Uh, but other than that, uh, uh, the main thing I was doing was serving as chair for uh, the uh, Infection and Prevention okay. Control Committee for Shands Hospital. So. I still serve on the committee. I'm no longer chairman, but I still sit in the committee. And I enjoy doing that. So if you were to think about um, changes you've seen in, in the health professions since you started as dean in Philadelphia in 1975, what do you think is the most significant? One of the most significant, and I'm still trying to figure out 
what it all means are the degrees that they're getting. Because PTs went from baccalaureate to master's, and now they're at the doctorate level. So the, our, all of the PTs now are getting doctors of physical therapy, uh, which uh, I think is interesting. I remember when they went to the master's level, uh, and that was very controversial. I don't know that the doctorate of physical therapy was as controversial as the master's was, but uh, that was really a controversial move. The deans were really upset, quite honestly, when that happened. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, the move to a doctor of physical therapy was much smoother. Mm -hmm. I think uh, they've uh, shown a much uh, better move through the curriculum and uh, adjustments to the curriculum than they did before. So I, you know, I personally understand a lot better why, what they're doing and, and why they're doing it. Uh, so uh, I think that's uh, one of the changes. PAs have done the same thing. They're now at the master's level. So I, I think the elevation of degrees is something that's uh, rather interesting. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, perhaps the the number of degrees that have come out, you know, of, of the new degrees that have come out of, uh, in the allied health professions. It's amazing the numbers that uh, we now see that uh, are coming. Uh, the number of associate degrees. That have. If you look at uh, uh, the, the split between baccalaureate and associate masters and doctorates, there's still a lot more associate degree allied health professions than there are the others. And uh, um, which is fine, you know. I I, I think that's that's necessary, but uh, there uh, uh, they're they're certainly needed. And, uh, I guess in some ways, just from my understanding of the history, at least of OT and PT, there's relatively young fields that were really developed in response to wars, to a lot of having a lot of young people who were experiencing similar types of injuries who needed, so that it could become more scientific. And I guess with a young profession, especially with a lot of burgeoning technology generally, there is that opportunity to really specialize and diversify. Well, and a lot developed from uh really on-the-job training. Mm -hmm. If you look at the PTs and OTs particularly, uh, they uh, developed that way from uh, OJTs, if you will, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, initially baccalaureate and then to advanced degrees to the extent that they, they are today. And I'll tell you, I've I have benefited from uh, PTs, and uh, uh, and uh, they do a masterful job of uh, getting you back into the workforce. Mm -hmm. Tremendous job. They're uh, they're well trained, and uh, do a great do, do a great job in the health professions. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, um, it, is there anything else that you would add to any of the questions I've asked? Or? No, I don't okay. think so. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that we'll, this will end the uh, interview with Dr. Richard Gutekunst um, on uh, November 20th, 2008. Thank you, sir.